Thank you, Brother Steve, for that devotion. Appreciate that. The last couple of weeks, we've been uh, working through the book of Revelation, chapter 11. So if you'd like to turn over there. And I'm going to briefly go over a few things, and then we'll get right into where we left off last week. Um, Revelation, starting with, uh, with verse 1, it says, There was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. And the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread it underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Okay, we finished there last week, and let's just briefly go over this. Verse 1, we've seen that this rod measure the temple. It says, he's given me a rod. I read like a rod. And, um, and we see that this rod is a figure of the Bible, of the Word of God, the Gospel. Um, we're going to look at some verses if we get there this morning. But do you remember when Aaron uh, smote the waters? Do you remember what he smote it with? A rod. Okay, and, and, uh, and the waters turned into blood back in Exodus 7. And so, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The word of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is what everything is measured by. This temple here is the, is the body of believers, every one of God's elect. And it says the court that is without, it says this court is, going to, is given unto the Gentiles. And uh, we've seen that this, this word Gentile is the word um, that can be also translated nation or nations. And it's in whatever the context it, context, it could be applied to the God's people or Satan's dominion. Like it says, ye are a holy nation. And uh, over in uh, Revelation 11, verse 18, see where it says nations right there? That's the same Greek word, Gentiles. And the nations were angry. And so, depending on the context, um, uh, we get the, the meaning of that word that's used there. So this, holy, this, this court is going to trample down the temple. The holy city is the same thing as the corporate or the uh, God's elect. But this court, in the Old Testament, it surrounded the tabernacle. And that's what the... the that's what the enemy does with the church, the true God's elect that bring the true gospel. They're going to surround. And we've read various verses, like in Revelation 20, where it says um, Gog and Magog and so forth. It says, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. And then other verses where it says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies or compassed by armies, know that you know its desolation is near. So. When you see the church being overrun, the, the corporate church is this, or the external church is this court that's coming against the true gospel. And the, and the, the corporate church is going to be more apostate as we near the end of time, becoming more worldly and, and taking in more uh, false gospels and lies. And, and before you know it, the truth is pinched off. The truth is silenced because... The, the main voice out there now in the world is another gospel. And that's why it says these are going to trample. See, in verse 2, leave out the, the, uh, the court. The court which is without the temple, leave out. These aren't in the kingdom of God. These people are not born again. And it says the holy city, which is the same as the temple of God, shall they tread underfoot forty in two months. And we've seen that the 42... Is used as a um, is used in the Bible as a figure of the tribulation period. And God uses different numbers and words and types and figures, and we just have to really familiarize ourselves what what it's saying there and the language that surrounds the verse. So when you see, and we looked at, uh, uh, we went back to Second Kings where Elisha, uh, forty-two children came and mocked Elijah, and then two she bears came out and killed those 42 children, that's a picture of the tribulation period where the, where the gospel is mocked. The gospel is, is uh, trampled down. And then we looked at Re uh, Revelation 13 where it talked about the beast will come and, um, 
and it says there, and was given to him, uh, in verse 5, in Revelation 13, was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And what, what did he do here? He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and then that dwell in it. So it's real consistent, the number 42 being used. Then we get to the, the uh, <clears throat> number 3 there, verse 3, where it says, I'll give power unto my two witnesses. And we looked at a number of verses that had to do with the two, two going into the ark, uh, the 70, the Lord Jesus broke them up in twos. And they went forth and proclaimed the gospel. Now, why, why twos? Why, why not some other number? Because two is depicted as the church. Depending upon the language, it could be the true church, it could be a, the corporate or false church, corporate church. And so, um, we see that the two witnesses here are, are surely God's elect. They're the holy temple, they're the, the holy uh, city, they're the temple of God. So the two witnesses, they shall prophesy. And we've seen that... Um, all God's people are prophets, according to the scriptures. In, in Numbers chapter 11, um, we, read, we read about uh, these, these 70 that were filled with the Spirit of God, and they prophesied, and then two came up and said, hey, there's two, there's two men still prophesying. What are they doing doing that, you know, telling Moses? And Moses answered and said, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his Spirit upon them. Say. And so one is, a prophet is one that just merely declares the scriptures, declares the gospel, the word of God. And so, um, let's see now. We left off right there, but I want to I talk about this. Uh, well, of course, in 1 Thessalonians 5.20, uh, the Bible says, despise not prophesying. Okay, despise not proclaiming the gospel. And that's what we do when we bring forth the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we also looked at Revelation 14 where it says the 144,000, it says these are virgins. In Revelation 14 there, it says in their mouth was found no guile. And that's because they were bringing forth the gospel, the truth. And in and Proverbs it says a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Now, this, this number here, 1260 days, we have to find out what period of time is it talking about. Because it's not a literal 42 months about the tribulation period. It's just a number given because in, in, the, in the same chapter, God uses three and a half days as the tribulation period. And so we have to find out what time period is this 1260 ga days God is talking about. And... Um, we know that the end of that 1260 days, look at verse 7, Revelation 11. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That is the beginning of the tribulation period, the 1260 days. And so the, when, do, when did it start? When did the 1260 days start? So when we go over to Revelation 12, Read this with me here, and start with verse 1. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Now there's a lot of figurative spiritual language here, but um, this woman is the church. Okay? She's clothed with the sun. She's clothed with the go gospel of Christ, the light of Christ. Um, and, and the moon under her feet. In other words, she's come from darkness to light. She's overcome Satan's dominion, been born again. And upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And again, that brings it right in with the fullness of all God's elect, the twelve. And so, we're being consistent with this language. It goes on down to verse 5. And it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And in verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Twelve hundred and sixty days. Same thing what we read over in Revelation 11. But listen, but when you read this language, she had a child that was caught up into God and to his throne. Okay? Caught up to God and to his throne. When you read... 
uh, in Hebrews chapter, uh, listen to this language here. When, when was the timing of this, this 1260 days? It says, in ver uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it says, But this, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And then over in Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So you see that, that this throne, when he sat down, when he was caught up, it has to do with the cross. It has to do with the, with the, with the, with the blood of Christ, with the, with the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit. Because look at the language that follows. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in it, and his angels. We're in Revelation 12, 7. And then verse 8 says, And prevail not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. The old serpent called devil, the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So it has to do a lot with the cross, the 1260 days, or the pouring forth of the, of the, uh, the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. And so, we got the 1260. Now notice, I want to bring, before I go on, notice the same language in verse 6. Let's read that again. And the woman fled into the wilderness. This woman is the church, and where she is, uh, had a place prepared by God, of God that they should feed her there 1,203 score days, 1,260 days. Feed, who's going to feed her there? The church is going to feed the church. Okay, we feed the uh, we we proclaim the gospel and God's people feed on the bread of life. If you remember in Acts chapter twenty, it says almost the the same type of language there about feeding. In verse twenty eight, it says, "Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which He had purchased with His own blood." And, and there's other parables, like in Matthew 24. Let's see if I could uh, get that one for you real quick. In Matthew 24, where it says, um, uh, maybe, what verse did I write down for that? It talks about a, um, a faithful witness. In verse 44, it says, Therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as you think, as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? See that? So we feed the church of God by bringing the true gospel. So that's, that's how this, this woman fled into the wilderness to be fed. And this is what we feed upon is the word of God. And, and, and we're not going to get it from the world. We're going to get it from the, 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 the woman, the body of believers, the temple of God. And that's why we come to church. We feed upon the Word of God. We read our Bibles and we take in the spiritual nourishment. But what I'm trying to get at is see the same language in Revelation 12, 6, where it talks about the 1260 days. Now look at verse 14. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished. But now God's using another uh, type of language. For a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Now why didn't God put 1260 days there? See? Because it's a different time period now. Before it was from the cross or the pouring of Pentecost all the way to the, be end of, uh, the beginning of the tribulation period. That's the 1260 days. And that's why he used another language here when he says time, times, and a half a time. The church will be nourished all the way to the end of time. God's people will be always fed with the true gospel. But this here is the tribulation period. This time, times, and a half a time. And um, 
just to give you a quick example to show you comparing spiritual with spiritual, look at the language. I'll read this to you in Daniel real quick. And listen to how God uses time, times and half a time, as far as the, uh, the, the saints being trampled upon. In Daniel 7.25, it says... Um, and verse uh, 7 and verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and a dividing of time. That's the same type of language of the gospel being silenced, trampled down. The, holy, the court is trampling in this holy city. And then the, uh, another one there is in Daniel 12, verse 6 and 7 where it uses time, times, and a half a time. It says, And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand up to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half, when he shall have accomplished to shatter or scatter the whole... The power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So we're, we're right in line with what time, times and a half a time mean. It's the tribulation period when the saints will be scattered and they'll be trampled upon. So that's why um, I had a question last week. Isn't, isn't 1260 days the same as 42 months? Well, you can work it out like that, but it, God's not pleased to give us that same number there. That's why he gave us time, time and a half a time. So if we look at it from 1260 days from the start of the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit or the gospel going forth to the end of the tribulation period, that's the time frame of 1260 days. And that's why he, he, he in verse 14 of Revelation 12, he, he chose to use time, times and a half a time. Same thing as the woman going into the wilderness being fed, but only this time it's now for a time, time and a half a time. It's during the tribulation. So God's just reassuring that the saints will be nourished all the way to the end of time. And isn't that a blessing? Whereas the court is going to be outside and they're given unto the nation, Satan's dominion. And that's why they're going to trample the truth down. Okay? So I just wanted to clarify that. Now let's go to Acts chapter um, 2. Because it says there that they'll prophesy, okay, for 1260 days. And we're going to read something here in Acts that you don't find in the Scriptures um, as much as you do in, in the book of Acts. So if, if you go to, uh, if, there's so many verses here that I've, I've kind of um, jotted down, but I'm not going to read them all, but I'll, I'll, th I'll give them to you if you want to read them at another time. But if we go to... To Acts chapter 2, we're going to see the pouring of the Holy Spirit here, the pouring forth. And I, I made an analogy. If I took some oil and I poured it here on a piece of platform, you'd see the oil just spread. Okay? And that's what the Lord Jesus said. He's going to, the, the Holy Spirit will pour forth in the kingdom. The spread of the gospel will go forth. People coming into the kingdom. Now, before I read that, um, Jesus said something interesting in John 14. I'll read this to you. He said in verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he also, and greater works than me shall he do, because I go to my Father. Well, we're going to see what the greater works are. And if you remember in Revelation 7, or John 17, it says... Um, uh, let's see, we're in verse 20. Neither pray I these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And so that's what we do when we go forth with the word of God. We're going forth with the gospel. But watch how this is, really comes out here in the book of Acts, okay? Look at Acts chapter 2, 41, starting with verse 41. Acts chapter 2, 41. It says, And they gladly received his word, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000. Okay, now keep in mind, we're going to see this spread. Okay, so there's 3,000. Verse 47, 
praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Okay, let's go over to Acts chapter 4. Look at verse 4 there. How, how be it many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Now we have 5,000. Three, five. And, and look at verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 14. 5, verse 14. And believers were, were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. There's the spread of the gospel. Look at Acts chapter 6. Look at the first part of verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples multiplied. Okay. Look at verse 7. And the word of God increased, spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And the great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Okay. Look at... Uh, Let's go over to Acts chapter 9. Look at verse 42. It was known in Joppa, it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Okay, let's go to Acts chapter 10. Look at 44 and 45 there. Acts 10, 44 and 45. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them all, which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 24 there. Acts 11, verse 24. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Okay, just two more. Look, look at Acts chapter 12, and verse 24. Acts 12, 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And one more. Acts chapter 16 and verse 5. Um, and so the church is established in the faith and increased in number daily. It's very clear. And it's not that, it's not that every day you read these things and you have that in mind. So if you would mark them down... Uh, you'd have them before you. It's the pouring forth. Something's happening now that God is going forth with His gospel and bringing His elect into the kingdom. Satan has been vanquished right at the cross and the Holy Spirit is poured forth. And we see that God's people coming in. Not to mention you go through Acts, you'll read about the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, the, the conversion of Saul, Cornelius, many that were uh, come together of the Gentiles became saved. Lydia and her household, um, the, the jailer at Philippi, all these. God's painting a picture of now I'm, I'm spreading forth the gospel. The oil is being poured forth. And now the word of God's going forth. And they're taking it by the word. We got a little bit of this, this in the Old Testament with uh, Jonah. You remember Jonah went into Nineveh? It was a three-day journey. He only went in a one-day's walk, one-third of the way. Already, if we know what one-third means, it means the, the saints, those that are saved. Remember in Zechariah, he says, two-thirds will perish, one-third I will bring through the fire and cleanse them, and they shall call upon me. And Jonah went one-third into, into Nineveh, and what happened? The whole city became saved. Well, how did the gospel get spread? He only went one day through. The, the people, God's people took it forth. The king uh, made a proclamation and, 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 and everybody repented. It said they sat in, in sackcloth and ashes. And so that's a picture. And, 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 and it's not a coincidence that all these people got saved. It's a picture of God's elect, that whole city. And, and Jesus talks about this in Matthew. He says the, the men of Nineveh will stand up in the day of judgment and, and they'll be right there with me. And they're, they're part of God's elect. And so that's a picture that's painted, hidden, right inside the book of Jonah there that um, as we compare spiritual with spiritual, we, we, we see this. And so um, it's all these things that God gives us the wisdom and understanding to, to see these things, just like salvation. It, it's all 100% of God. When we understand anything of His Word as we study the Bible alone, 
The Holy Spirit teaches us these things. It's all of God. We can't take any credit for this because it's a spiritual book. And so this is, um, this is why it's important to, um, to, to compare spiritual with spiritual. And I just want to throw these things out if those who have an interest in doing that. Um, what I found in the last 20 years in working with the spiritual teaching is that you know, we always pray. Pray for wisdom and understanding that God gives us these things. Compare spiritual with spiritual. Uh, check out everything in God's, with God's Word. It must harmonize with the Scriptures. Okay? Uh, do, not, uh, do word studies. See how God uses words and numbers throughout the Bible. Don't go outside the Bible to get your answers. For example, if you're say, reading something, say, that's the Pope. Or this, is, or this is speaking about Russia. You're going outside the Bible. You, you don't re, that's not the Pope. You're not, you're not understanding that verse. When you apply a spiritual, when, when you're doing a spiritual study and you apply a physical aspect to it, you're wrong. You have to check the scripture out. Now, I'll give you an example. When Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up spiritually. What did the Jews think? Physically. He said, he said, how could this man, uh, or how does that go? Uh, it took 46 years or something to build this temple. How is he going to raise it up in three days? See? He, and then he said, uh, if you drink my blood and uh, eat my flesh, you, ha you have life in yourselves. And, and they said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? See, they looked at it physical. And so that's one, uh, one rule. Keep in mind, and, that's, and, and you can test it. You see how people today use the number 1,000 to, to say there's going to be a 1,000-year reign in Jerusalem or whatever. That's wrong. See? And when you follow the context of Revelation 20, it's all figurative spiritual language. The, the Holy Spirit or the, has a great chain in the hand, bound Satan with this great chain. It's not a literal chain. We've got to know what the chain means. We've got to know what the 1,000 years mean. And so that's a, um, and the other thing is you have to have scripture to back up what you're talking about. You know, you have to have the Bible. You have to compare spiritual with spiritual. And, um, and so whatever we hear, whoever it's from, and, 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 uh, and of course uh, uh, we know this from scripture, uh, whatever we read, we have to check it out with the word of God. We have to. Because this is the only truth that we have today. And so um, that's, a good, that's a good measuring point or a good guideline to follow is comparing spiritual with spiritual. Uh, have scripture to, to uh, references to back up which, and, and have it harmonized throughout the whole Bible. And, and uh, if it doesn't harmonize, you're wrong. The Bible's not wrong. And so, and so what we have to do is test it, see, and, and test these things. And of course, uh, word studies, you know, to do word studies. So going, going, um, going back to our, our study, and um, notice in Revelation, okay, we covered that. And then um, notice they were clothed in, in sackcloth, okay, at the end of Revelation 11 there, they were clothed in sackcloth. And... Um, why, the, why, is, why are they clothed in sackcloth? Why is God given us that language? And when we, we look at, we already looked at uh, Jonah, some, but do you remember in Jonah, when Jonah cried, yet 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown? It says in verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth. Okay? Repented. That's what sackcloth means. They repented. And, if, and uh, do you remember in... Um, Matthew 11, the Lord Jesus said this. In Matthew 11, verse 21, he says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which was done in you and had, that had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. See? So repenting is goes right with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, except ye repent, you'll likewise perish. We have to be granted repentance. Our Lord Jesus Christ grants us repentance unto life. Okay? And um, 
I'll read another one that goes with this. In Acts chapter 3, 18 through 20, there it says, Repent ye therefore, uh, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So right there is with repentance. I'll give you another one in Mark chapter 1, 14 and 15. There it says, um, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So repentance goes right with being uh, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he shed his blood for our sins. And unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And so they're clothed in sackcloth. In other words, they're clothed with repentance. They're clothed with the gospel. It goes right together. This word clothe is the same word as the, in Revelation. They were clothed in white raiment. They were clothed in, in white robes. They were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. It all has to do with the righteousness of Christ. And, uh, and he took upon our sins. And, um, and so he granted us repentance. And a broken and a contrite heart, the Bible says. He will not despise. So going on to verse 4 now. It says, these are the two olive trees. Okay. Now, we see the number two being over and over again as the church. Now he's given us the two olive trees. Now why olive trees? Could have been two something else, but he's picking two olive trees here and he's picking two candle lights, candlesticks. And so let's look at this word olive trees. If we go over to Zechariah chapter 4, in Zechariah chapter 4, it says, starting with verse 11, then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? He said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Okay? These are the two anointed ones. Now, working with this verse in Zechariah, see this word empty? In verse 12 it says, uh, These two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. That word empty means to pour forth, to pour out. Okay? And if you look, look at how God uses that word, in the book of uh, Song of Solomon, right after Ecclesiastes, look at, listen to how God uses this, uh, this same Hebrew word, empty. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, 1 through 3, the Songs of Songs, which is Solomon. Let him, this is a picture of Christ in the church. It says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of thy savor, of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. That word poured forth is the same word empty. Thy name is as ointment, and that Hebrew word ointment is translated 180 times oil. Thy word is as oil poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Who's the virgins? God's elect, God's people. Thy name is as oil poured forth. Okay? The gospel going forth. The pouring forth of the Holy Spirit. The oil. Okay? Those that are filled with the Holy Spirit that speak forth the gospel. Thy name is as ointment. Oil poured forth. Therefore do thy virgins love thee. And so it says, These, these two anointed ones pour forth the oil. The church. That's the number two again. And I thought it was interesting and, uh, to, to look up these words in, in, the, in the concordance as far as what the Hebrew and, and, and means on these words, anointed ones. And this word anointed, this word in verse 14, these are the two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. That word anointed means oil. Okay? 
And the word ones means sons. Sons of the oil, sons of God. Okay, these are the two anointed ones that stand before the, the, uh, the Lord of the whole earth. These are, this is the church. This is God's elect that pour forth that oil. Okay, and that's why God is using two olive trees. The oil is inside of the olives, isn't it? And, and, and in Matthew 25 about the wise, the oil was in the vessels of the wise. They were saved people. They were the elect. And those that had not the oil, they were none of his. See? It's so consistent. It's just letting the Bible be its own, your own interpreter and, and, uh, and so, <clears throat> so forth. And uh, here's, here's some other uh, verses that I, I jotted down here for you. In Psalms 89, 20, it says, I have found David my servant with my holy, holy oil. My holy, holy oil have I anointed him. And that's how we become saved when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Proverbs 21:20. There is treasure to be desired in oil and the dwelling of the wise. Okay? And uh, what else here? And um, so, anyway, so, so the Holy Spirit pours forth the oil, pours forth the gospel. So these two oil, olive trees, is the church. Okay? They're the church. They're God's elect. In Psalms 52, 8, it says, But I am like a green olive tree, Planted in the house of the Lord. Okay, so it's all consistent on what this, this number two or these two olive trees uh, back in uh, Revelation 11. Now, to finish up this verse, boy, time goes by so quick. T to finish, huh? Okay. Okay, let's, let's. Okay. Okay. 